Hello, Reza. <laughs> well, well, welcome to our um, guest lecture, uh, guest speaker series, industry guest speaker series. We are very honored to have you for this week. Um, I just want to, before starting, I just want to uh, show your um, showreel, which is mind blowing. And then we come back. And then, okay. So I'm going to screen share it for those who are not here. Turn that light on, the, the one that says a uh, front light. So we see the front. Okay, no, no, not you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you have worked in Tokyo and then Sydney and then London, now in Vancouver. So you are the Marco Polo of the visual effects. <laughs> So was yeah. that you know was that intentional that you just decided to travel all around the world and work on different projects? Is it like what you enjoy to to be in different um, about all the productions that you worked were like top level and you know world class productions, but like in, in very different locations? Uh, yeah, actually, I really enjoy you know. Uh, being on travel, see other places, as much as I can. The experiencing each uh, new job, we have the privilege, I guess, that we can do that, possibly do that. And uh, also, another one is at the same time, it's following the cooler project that I really like to do. Okay. To some other so, if there's a chance that I can do something, I would have to do it. We have a bit of uh, disruption in, in your talking. It was better at the beginning, but it's just like a bit choppy now. Is it better now? So I think it's better now. OK. Um, so is it like you, you, you know, do you select the projects that you go and work on at the moment or? You just go with the flow. 
Uh, it's a bit of both. So, for example, I get like different uh, offerings to different offers, and usually I try to find the more interesting ones. And mm. it's in a different country that also like to have the the experience of yeah. But sometimes you have to just follow the flow of it. So there's not like always this chance, but still now I have, which I feel very lucky. Awesome. So you are a senior lighting artist and a senior lighting and look development artist. What is that? So let, let our students know about it. So the first uh, part from in this here is just lighting itself. Uh, the lighting, look development and compositing. So what it does is something like director of photography for a movie. And we have the shot, it's ready. The uh, scenes are there, the layout, every, all the objects is there. What we do in the main is um, put the lights, different lights, create a mood. Mm -hmm. If there is any, the look different parts are always another bit that look there on the shaders and how everything works. But if you need to change the sequence or shot or something has to be added, updated, whatever, we have to also as well do it on the friend side to overwrite that shader. And another task is to do the composite mm -hmm. of the we usually, I mean, we always have to do that. So after we render them with different layers, you bypass this, put them, bring them uh, into compositing, usually do. Mm -hmm. Check with the director with the final results or art director, the supervisor, get the update time. That's what we do. Okay. So, so like, uh, from, from the time that you receive the shots to start lighting and then look development and then compositing. So you, you take, so you, you, you are responsible for, for all of those tasks and like kind of, it's kind of like finalizing and finishing the shot, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's about it. Uh, depends on the pipeline of the studio. Of each studio, they have their own pipeline and their own different workflows. Mostly, look development is by the look dev guys. They're another unit, but it's something that every now and then we have to change the shader, how it's gonna look. But from the beginning, as a senior artist, it's usually that uh, start the main lighting, create the light read, the whole, and uh, go to the look as much as possible and update the uh, also the files and composite. Mm -hmm. And in different situations, different companies, different uh, uh, of the show, like for example, in line, I was responsible for a team uh, that we had some shots to do. So my task, for example, over there was to automate everything, to create a loop, automate everything as much as possible. The other uh, junior artist, mm -hmm. and also the compositing shots, uh, the main compositing uh, template, just up to the next time. So they do the final touches, different mm -hmm. shots. Sometimes I would also do some myself. The ones okay. that was real like myself. But at the same time, because there are other shots to do, I had to take everything for them and support them both artistically and take so if they have any problem technical wise, I have to sit for them, problem solve them, and at the same time I have to be responsible for their the way what they're doing with the shot actually. So if there's any in the light, the direction, the you know, any shot, whatever. Just okay. So we're still uh, experiencing a bit of like this connection. Let me just uh, mute uh, us ourselves, and then um, you know, and let's see if it's the the loop from our side. Hang on. If it would be like that.
Well, I can't hear you, but if you can hear me, correct. Uh, I mean, that doesn't work. Not hearing you. Yeah. So just like so. So when when I uh, when I muted myself, your sound was coming better. So I ask question, and then uh, Matthew over there mutes me, and then when you talk, so there's no uh, you know disruption. So <laughs> yes, finding solutions. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, can you let like, hang on? Hang on. Okay. Okay, that's better. So um you know, you have worked in in uh, Japan for I believe five years, isn't it? Uh, no, it was two and a half years. Two and a half years. Oh, okay. So, and then uh, so then then you worked in in uh, Sydney and London and now Vancouver. So like it's very interesting because um, many of our students are interested to know what is the differences between these working uh, environments. And like kind of like com company cultures and like the the quality, you know, because you have worked on, on a wide range of different projects, so it would be interesting for us to uh, to know on that side uh, uh, and and how you experienced different working environments and and like how each one of them had different merits for you. Can you mute it? Okay. So, uh, yes, they're very different. The main difference is actually with the culture of each country and also the size of the studios, the projects that they can do. For example, Japan, uh, they, uh, they have a lot of work to do, a lot of projects, but they also, they're not as big. So they're usually smaller projects, usually uh, easier projects. I, I can't say easier because they have their own challenges. And the work culture over there is a little hard. So you have to work really hard in Japan and they, they expect a lot of a lot from you. And at the same time, they have a very different distinct, uh, distinctive projects. So from 2D animation, not 2D animation, like 2D renders that look like uh, they've been hand drawn to fully render the super realistic, sometimes stylistic. They have very different of that. And uh, but in case of Sydney and London and Vancouver, I think because they're all these Hollywood studios, the culture is usually the same. It mostly goes to the culture of each certain country. So, for example, in Australia, they're more laid back, easier to work with. Um, in London, it's a little more tense, but at the same time, people are more friendly. I mean, it's very different, each one of them, but not by a mark, but not by a lot. Uh, can you? Yeah. So um, what was the most challenging project, you know, like challenging project that you have worked on? Uh, for sure, it was Lion King. Uh, because when I started working on the Lego movies, it was the first, they were the first uh, major uh, blockbuster uh, feature film that I had to work on that kind of level. In the beginning, they were very hard to just learn uh, the new, the, the tools, the techniques. Uh, it was a totally different new world for me. But in case of something being challenging, Lion King by far was a lot. It was the most, the hardest thing I've ever worked on. Mm. So what, what was that it made it harder? Like, was it the, the nature of the creatures in it or like the scale of the production? What, what, what so let's say we want to know what is, um, what, what are the aspects or factors that makes a shot or a project like challenging for us? Well, first, it was the fact that uh, 
it was fully animated movie. It was just an animation movie that had to go as real as possible. Because usually in movies, live action movies, you have at least one or two elements of live action, but of footage. Here we had none. It was just animation, but we had to make it look like that. Um, and uh, also the scale of the project, like the amount of, it was super heavy. And the render times were really long. And uh, the files were extremely heavy to work with. And we had a huge amount of shots to work on. And they were also, especially on this sequence in the beginning, for example, it was supposed to be nothing. It was supposed to be very short. And then uh, through the progress that we were working on, they added more and more shots. They added the song. And the song was becoming longer and longer. Uh, or in the last minutes, the, some uh, shots were just pruned from the movie. They were just removed. New shots were coming out of nowhere, so you have to just uh, keep updating and updating. And it was uh, nine months, all in nine months. So on that regard, it was the hardest thing to do. So let's say a like, how long a shot um, stays with you as the senior lighting artist? So let's say that there's, let's say an, an average. Like, um, so I know that you're not the only uh, lighting artist within the team. So like you, like I, it's in terms of like, you know, the, the time that is allocated to each person, like how long you're busy with one shot? Depends on shot per shot. It, they usually are like two or three days of work, but if it's just one shot, that you work like three three days just on one shot. Um, it's gonna usually take like that. But we had shots, for example, the uh, it was in the demo reel, the first shot. It's a huge landscape shot that's coming out, the zoom back from Aina. Yeah, for example, that one, I that one took months to finish. Yeah, and it's not just about the lighting process itself, sometimes it's the layout is changing. So like they change the layout, they change the animation. So the lights that you carefully put on every single object, now they don't work, you have to update them again because everything has been updated. It's not just uh, the lighting. The animation is updating at the same time that you're working on. The camera angles are, work are changing, the environments are changing, everything is changing. So. For example, we just to give a better view, when we start, it's usually the basic layout in the beginning. Sometimes there is no, not even an animation on anything. They're just exposes. So we just create the lights as, as good as possible, match all the sequence together. So the continuity, we fix everything. And uh, we're also ahead of the curve. So every time, um, there is a new update. We don't have to go from scratch. We, we have the base, and we just uh, change small amounts as much as possible. That's what we. Why sometimes they take months. Some of them to do that. But sometimes I had a shot that took like two hours, maybe. Okay, Matthew, do you want to Matthew? Do you want to keep it on uh, the, the microphone for a while? So if it keeps uh, breaking, then. We just carry on. I think uh, we have a better connection now. So Reza, uh, let us know. So what is the what is the process of your creative process? That is very interesting for us as well. So let's say how you are briefed about a shot. So let's say how do you receive a shot and you are briefed? OK, what you should do and how you go through the process of um, you know, finding out your way through and then like how much of creative input you have on, on, on the, because lighting is all about cinematography and photography. It's all art. It's, it's very creative, highly creative task. So, and then like, and how you gradually, you know, transition into like the techie side. So, because I know that you're a very highly technical artist as well. So it's it's very interesting for us to understand the process as well. Uh, yeah, 
If it's a live action movie, for example, I worked on uh, the latest Wonder Woman movie. It's not out yet, so it was absent from the real. I mean, you have the poster over there. I can see <laughs> you like. Yeah, yeah, there it is. For, yeah. for example, for that, yeah, yeah. digital character over there, digital doubled, and uh, it was shot in a studio, so we had to match the light perfectly as good as possible to what is being shot. So we change the character from the live action to the digital double version, or there is this monster or the whatever that is. Uh, I can't explain about that much. So uh, some of them we have to match with whatever is being taken. So the creativity is usually out. In other cases, we usually they give us some samples or explain to us. It's usually start with a sample. Uh, with a picture or a, um, preferably a concept art for what's been there, what they want. If they give us a, a, a concept art, it's usually much better. But we, or sometimes it's just a picture. For example, in Lion King, we had some, uh, they gave us some pictures of the real, natural uh, what is it, documentary that we wanted to look like this. And then we started doing as best as possible that, we, that I think, for example, this is going to look good in this kind of way. And then every day, it's usually every day, daily, we call them dailies. We go and sit with the supervisor and art director and sometimes director, that would be awesome. And they just give notes to every shot. Okay, what about you have to test this? What about you do this? We do different variations, and over time, um, we have different versions. So we choose something, one of them, go forward. And it's always taking notes from the director or art director, usually. OK. Um, what a, you, you said your first like blockbuster project that I know that like you were one of the most active um, artists in the in the TV commercial world that uh, actually um, going, yeah yeah it's it's very interesting that we know we knew each other about 20 years isn't it but we've never met <laughs> we met we met la we met last was it last year that you came to Oslo? two years ago it was like that year yeah 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 so like uh yeah Reza was was a very um well-known active uh, artist in the field of TV commercial and, and visual effects for for um, you know short films and different projects. Um, so you said that your first blockbuster like project was Lego Movies, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. In so let, let us. It's a very interesting movie, actually, in terms of um, lighting. And I believe it's one of the early movies that they uh, deployed uh, USD in the process wow. of, of production. So um, we would like to hear, you know, some some stories on uh, on on that from you. Oh, about the USD, I don't know much to be honest. How they were using that because that was not what we were doing. That was mostly for the other departments. Uh, what they have in Animal Logic, they have their own render engine called Glimpse, which they uh, started from ground up. It's a path tracer, a very good one. And uh, what was the question? Sorry, oh, about uh, the Lego movies. Sorry. Yes, they wanted extreme. They wanted uh, something extremely colorful, uh, bright, and colorful. We had so many lights in that scene, and they were something that uh, they invented themselves. Uh, they called it lighting assets. So, I mean, we usually have it in different projects, but this one in Animal Logic was very specific. So for example, you have a robot, and um, we would just create lights inside the robot or inside one asset. There's a building, there's a car, we would put as much as lights as possible in different areas and optimize them to become uh, faster to render, but at the same time, for example, if there is a there's a character inside a car and the car is outside, we would put 
some extra lights inside the car itself, apart from what it's being casted from outside. So it's super colorful. Everything is uh, illuminated with different colors from everywhere. And uh, yeah, that was, a, and our supervisor, Craig Welch, was a really amazing supervisor. Very great artist. Beautiful. Um, and let us know about your experience, uh, actually, the projects that you worked on in Tokyo. Oh, yeah. In Tokyo, I was working, I worked on three different, Four projects over there. One of them was this kind of anime. I don't have it at the moment over here. Um, there is this kind of anime type that I was uh, I was the look developer over there. I was look developer, compositing and rendering, heat lighting and all of that. And I had to automate everything for the shot artist. So I was some, something like a lead for them. And I was directly talking with the director over there. It was uh, like these Japanese inks that are, you know, so all the characters had that. Uh, it was a very uh, super stylized one. Then there was this uh, Disney projects that uh, called Sum Sum that we started doing the, the company, Polygon Pictures, the, the main engine was Mentor A at the time. But with what we wanted to do with the Sumsums, we wanted to look very pretty and real, like more like Pixar style, Disney style. But at the same time, we didn't have time or budget to do that. So uh, I chose, for that show, I chose this render engine called 3D Light. It was a path tracer like Renderman. Yes, we worked on that one. Uh, there was another Tomb Shader anime project. Also, we did it with, with uh, 3D Light. We had to create the shaders, design the shaders from scratch, the workflow, because uh, Tomb Shader is a very different piece. It may look easy, but it's actually way harder than super realistic ones, because you you easily see the problems that, oh, this is a 3D, 3D shape and not 2D. So there are many, many tricks that we have to just put inside the shaders, the passes, so many controls so we can change everything in compositing later, all these different passes. And uh, after that one, I joined a company called Prism Plus for Valhalla Games. It was a Naruto Shinobi Striker for PS3, for PS4, sorry. In Unreal Engine, that was a, quite a challenge because I was the lighting and look developer look developer supervisor for that show also had to come up with a way to uh, do all the modeling and texturing at the same time. And it was quite hard because that was the first time I was doing anything in game engines. It's a totally different world. And also we had to make it more like Copic painting, this Copic, and make it flat 2D, something that Unreal couldn't do at the time. So that was quite a challenge as well. Uh, yeah, that's all about it. Um, it's very interesting that when you when you talk about your difference, your experiences in different companies, um, you talk about like these uh, rendering engines and some companies like Animal Logic, um, they have their own, uh, you know, in-house rendering engines. So. And then, then, then there is this new trend of everybody moving gradually towards real-time rendering and, and, and all these like game engine um, integration with the production. Have you experienced or have you done any research or just like R&D on that side? I don't know if you guys are considering that. Some studios are uh, more and more con pushing themselves towards real-time with Unreal Engine or real-time solutions, uh, game engines basically, because with the introduction of path tracing that now Unreal Engine has, you can create almost the same level of quality in lighting that you could do with softwares like Arnold or Renderman, the higher, I mean, not, not as good as them, but it's close enough. 
and the retina times are extremely fast in a matter of usually real they're not real time if you push it too hot too but they're like one second which is basically real time compared to sometimes hundreds of hours that you have to do but there are also limitations on how heavy the scene is because it's not yet over there but yes everybody are moving more and more forward toward there i am at the same time, I right now actually I'm working on this uh, new technology for virtual lighting. In uh, if you've seen uh, the behind the scene of the Mandalorian, for example, instead of bl uh, blue screen behind them, they put uh, this virtual set, virtual environment, which is connected to Unreal Engine with the path tracing. So there are monitors around them. So, for example instead of lighting the characters and later uh, they try to match the, the CG environments with the character, now this is reversed. We have the environment first in full 3D around the character, around the actors, and they are illuminating lights on the, on the subject, which is like the perfect plan that we can. And you, we also have the reflections. Uh, for example, if there's a motorcycle or a car, the reflections are accurate. You see that the reflections over there, and we can also add different lights if you want in a matter of seconds. That's a yeah. new trend that is starting, which is very interesting. So you can you have to be on the set of location. It's fabulous. Um, one very uh, very useful tips for especially our student is that. Uh, we listened to your story on how you got your, I know that your first uh, overseas position was uh, Polygon Pictures, wasn't that? Yeah. Okay, so like, uh, and, so, and your first uh, blockbuster um, position that you got was uh, in Animal Logic was um, uh, Lego movies, yeah. So like, um, it's, it's, very, it's very useful because like our students are going through that journey, like what, what was, like, how, how you went through that, how you presented yourself and how, and how you convinced uh, those companies to trust your talents and, and work with you. And like what, what, what how, you know, I mean like what was, what was that journey that you went through? In the beginning, it was very harder to be to be fair to just enter the industry. So when I I had uh, I mean you remember I had a lot of uh, TV commercials. They were smaller ones, but they were not because it, they were just something that a one person I had to do. I was usually a one man team. The level of quality were not as high as possible. So it's better to work as a team and you concentrate on just one department that. What you want to do modeling, you want to do animation, layout, lighting, render, compositing, whatever. Uh, FX, for example, destructions of particles. So when I joined Polygon Pictures, the projects were not, they were very interesting projects, but they were not as heavy. So it was easier to blend in. And uh, yeah, but once you're inside the job, I, I believe it, Better to just try to do as good as you can. Doesn't matter the scale or level of the job. I've seen a lot of people that they say, ah, this is nothing very special. This, this is just a stupid show or whatever. Who cares? Well, it's going to be in your resume at the end. It's going to be in your demo reel. So try to make it as good as possible. That's something I tried to do over there. And uh, yeah, every now and then there may be a supervisor or somebody in a big studio that something in your work catches his eye. So for example, for me, um, working on those Tsum Tsums, the Disney ones, was very hard. And I tried to make it as good as I can possible, and more than the standard they actually they wanted to do. I mean, they were happy about it, but try to push it as much as I can. So also, because at the end, it's your job. That's what you do. Everybody is going to know you about uh, it. And uh, yeah, the lighting supervisor, Craig Welch in Animal Logic, he saw that, some of those Disney shots, and he enjoyed it because 
we liked it because it was very similar to what they wanted to do in the Lego movie. And yeah, you get in. And also, it's the fact of uh, working in a small team or studio, it's very different than working in a big company. Everything is, uh, everybody has their own tasks, you know, uh, of the management, it's totally different. So usually it's very hard to uh, just enter, a, directly enters a huge company. Doesn't matter how good of an artist you are. The other side is how to work in a team, how to get direction, how to publish the, everything. You know, it's not just art. It's uh, the, also the office kind of uh, way of working, the workflow, all of that. So the more you work, they're, they're also going to appreciate it now, more. They're like, huh, he has experience. Okay, let's take him. Perfect, perfect, awesome. Um, so don't, don't be encouraged, uh, don't, don't be discouraged. This incorrect, something like that. Don't do this correct. <laughs> don't, if, you, if you apply, for example, uh, and you never get any replies, which happens a lot, um, it's not going to be a sudden thing. It's going to be slow, slow, but it's going to certainly go there. If you're in the right track and follow it, of course. Perfect. Um, so what, what advice do you have for, um, for our students, if they want to, to follow your path. So let's say if our, our students wants to be a good uh, lighting and look development and compositing artist. So what they have to invest uh, creatively on the creative side and what they have to invest on the uh, technical side. It's half-half. Uh, as much as you need to be an artist, at the same time, you need to be technical because you're working with the tools. So you have to know how, uh, how they work. If there's a problem uh, rising, you have to know how to fix it. Uh, it's just the tools. So you need the technical part as well. But you should never um, uh, forget about the artistic side as well, unless if you want to just become like it technical director. So, so for example, uh, we have, as a, for lighting, we have lighting artists and lighting technical directors, technical directors. You can be both, but usually lighting artists are more tend towards um, artistic side. I mean, you need to be technical as well, but the technical directors are the ones that are more in the technical areas. So you need a coding, you need a small script, come up with a new way of uh, why something is not working, something is not in the pipeline, work uh, tools. You do that. So can you... So let's say, uh, what skills um, students would, let's say, invest on, would help them uh, to be better on the artistic side? or what application and tools they, so because things are changing. So, uh, but, but you, because you are at the heart of it, you can say that, hey, go and learn this tool, or hey, go, go and like do, I don't know, this um, art class or this, and then that's the future. So is there, is there any, anything that you can say on that side as well for us? Oh, of course. Uh, so first you, for example, you need to know Maya or Max. I mean, it's usually Maya when it comes to big studios. They usually work with Maya. Uh, you have to know that uh, there are different render engines. You better know the more you know, you have more chance to do crack it up. Uh, Renderman and uh, Arnold are usually the main ones in for feature films. Uh, there are other engines, for example, like uh, V-Ray, that they usually are done for other kind of CG renders, like architecture, as far as I know. Um, but don't quote me on that one. And uh, I, so, yes, there are many courses you can just have online. And at the same time, I think you have to know the basics of lighting as well. 
So what, when you watch a movie, try to realize, uh, you know, discover or go read about it, like why something is lit the way they are in this way. Or in, even in a movie, live action movie, they're really good. Paintings, I mean, study the movie, uh, how, see how they light it, why they light something, for example, why they put rim lights. And if they put a rim light, for example, on the left side, what do they do in the background, in the environment, in the, in the right side? It's good to know all of these, how to balance everything, how the light actually works in real life. So you can replicate it, duplicate it in CG. Paintings are really good also. Just look at the painting, drawing, see how they play with the colors. And color theory is usually very good thing to know, how different colors match together, and uh, how to, for example, separate an object from the environment. So I've seen a lot of art, uh, a lot of uh, artists uh, in the beginning, they usually put, for example, one light in the sky, and that's it, because it's illuminating everything, especially with path tracing technology, with all the GI that is casting, it looks pretty. But it, it looks real, but it doesn't look pretty. Um, you have to then learn how to study the movies, for example, study different movies, whatever you like and see how they separated the, light, the character from the environment. For example, they put rim lights around them. So they're brighter all over and they're separated from the environment or they put different blockers in the background or on the characters so they are more separated everything. So you can't just see something. See an object, and you're like, yeah, that's the first thing that I see in the shot is what, it, what I'm supposed to see. Awesome. So, so we're uh, moving towards the end of it. So it's um, question and answer. I, I just want to know who might have some questions from the top. Yes, Martin. Um, question. Um, Can you be loud? So, uh, does it help or is it useful to, um, uh, as a writing artist, to? Like, is it useful to know the interactions of uh, light on material and the properties of light? Is it useful to know uh, properties of materials and interactions they have as a lighting artist? That's a must, actually, I guess. That's a must. There are different kind of shaders or materials uh, that, uh, for example, the subsurface or the plastic, how something works on plastic. Sometimes you have to fake it with your lighting because of the limitations that we have, or we, we need to optimize something to make the renders faster because it's easy to just put the parameters are all of them as high as possible and just wait weeks for it to come from the render. Uh, sometimes you have to do cheating. So it's good to know how everything works. Like how the light is going to, uh, for example, come from a, a glass or uh, water, how it's going to be simulated when it's casting through an inside. Of course, we have to know it. Okay, good question. Good question. Um, there was any, any other questions here around? Are you sure? <laughs> so, you guys are there? Good. Okay, so so let's say for your last project, uh, what what kind of uh, set of tools you have used? So the last project was in Sony Pictures Image Works. It was a feature film. For Netflix over the moon. Uh, just say a little about that. It's done by the, it's the first movie that is being directed by Glenn King, the old animator from Disney. And the software we used over there, I, I cannot go very deep inside because of company secrecy and all that, but they were usually we work with Katana. There is this special um, software written by Foundry. 
which is the, which is node based like Houdini or Newt, or the lighting. So we import the lights over there, and with different uh, nodes, we just there are different functions, and the light rig is over there. The last one, for example, was and also Lion King that was also with Katana, and then we have Nuke to composite everything. That's a standard, and the render engines. For the last one was Arnold, but a different version of Arnold because Sony has a different version for themselves. They're developing, so it, it's just the name basically that is the same. Yeah, so I I I, I say it's better to learn Nuke, Arnold, uh, Nuke, Maya, and rather Renderman or Arnold. That's what I said. Katana is good to know. But it's, I guess it's not something that, it's not a piece of software that you can just learn by yourself at home. You need, you need a pipeline behind it, as far as I know. But yeah, try that one as well. It's a very good thing, perfect software. Okay, so uh, it's good guys to know that we uh, installed Katana. So we integrated Katana to the, to the set of tools that we have at school. Uh, since the beginning of this year, so you have this tool available. Any other questions? Yes, we have a question here, Jerry. Uh, working in a big industry, do you get to um, do, you have, do you have time to work on your own projects? Any chance? So, uh, do you have time? So, when you're working in a big industry, is there any time left for your for for you to work on your own projects? Not really. <laughs> yeah, they go really dense. Usually the projects, they go really, really dense. Sometimes we have to work overtime a lot. And many situations we have to work also on weekend, like usually Saturdays, we also have to work on that. Uh, usually there is not enough time, but it's also all upon you. Like how much do you enjoy what you do? And after, you know, uh, long days of work that you work on animation, on CG. After that, how much uh, do you have still energy or uh, what is it, uh, excitement to work on your own projects or do something else completely from computers? Okay, good question. The, 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 they can go really, really, uh, the deadlines are usually very tight. Okay, so one last question. Yeah. Is there any reason why you want to become a lighting artist? So, so why? Actually, that's a, that's a, that should have been my first question. <laughs> so, is there any reason that you wanted to be a lighting artist? In the beginning, I started as a CG generalist. That's what I wanted to do. I enjoyed to do, but. Uh, because of those commercials that I was doing, I had to do a lot of photography and cinematography as well on the live actions. And more and more, I got more interested in the lighting area. And uh, yeah, also the position that I had in animal uh, in Polygon Pictures in Japan, they didn't have a, an actual lighting department at all. So it was mostly everything done in comp. And I also had this chance over there to Say, hey, I can also light it here in the seed in 3D. That way, it's going to be much easier and faster than doing everything in concrete. So, yeah, it was the love for cinematography and at the same time, just this chance that I was in a good position over there that I could do something like that. Yeah. Sorry, I changed my phone a lot because I have a low battery. It's okay, it's okay. So we are at the end of it. So um, I think, um, yeah, thank you so much, Reza. It was, it was lovely to hear, uh, to listen to your story, to see your amazing work. And um, looking forward to see you in Oakland soon again, man. I hope so. <laughs> thank you, man. It was a very nice day, uh, conversation. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>